Welcome to the Secrets to Mindful Health podcast. I am your host, Beth Warren. Hi, everyone. Today's episode, I'm really excited to have a guest. Her name is Kim Shapira. She's also a registered dietitian, nutritional therapist, and author. She is all about helping her clients take back their relationship with food. She's a wife and mom of three kids and three pups. Her primary goal is to help you become your best self physically, emotionally, spiritually, and medically. She has a an amazing formal training in a method using six simple rules. And I don't even want to go further because I really want her to introduce herself and explain these six simple rules. So simple rules to make him sounds like (laughs) you know a little bit of an oxymoron. How can rules be simple? Yeah, that's, that's very well said. Hi, Beth. I'm Kim. I'm so happy to finally be having this conversation with you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I am curious on your take about the six simple rules. The thing is, is like, I really think they're more value systems. And the reason why I use the word rules is to kind of trigger you automatically into thinking like, oh, okay, rules is like, I learned all the things I do in life through rules. And so maybe this is a way that I can trick my mind into these new non-negotiable things that I need to do that help me sustain a certain lifestyle. Yes. So in other words, Kim was being sneaky. Yeah. But it, it sounds like there's <laughs> more there. Um, and I think this is what you wrote about in your book. So tell us a little bit about your book and how it all came together with these six simple rules. So I have been in private practice 27 years and I have always been kind of coaching my clients to practice eating when they're hungry. And as I started thinking about it, I'm like, oh my gosh, I really say the six same things to everybody, or we focus on the six same things. And I don't think that people are understanding them to the point that they need to, like people are always interested in what foods they should eat and what times they should eat the food and how much food they should be eating with literally no regard to what their body may be feeling how they slept the night before, how they're moving their body, what their body fat looks like and all these things. So basically I took all of my practice, 27 years of practice and put it into this book. And this book is called, this is what you're really hungry for. Mm. And um, I'm curious. I mean, I think, you know, the answer, but what do you think the answer is to this is what you're really hungry for? I'm such a soulful person. When you asked me that my mind went to, I'm, I'm really hungry for feeding my soul. Like, yeah, myself, like meaning so much more than the obvious. That's what it is. Right. And I would just simply say it's for peace, peace of Mm -hmm. mind to be well. Right. We spend so much time thinking about it. Yes. And that's why I was so excited to have you on, because I feel it's pretty unique to have two registered dietitians on a podcast together. You've done a ton of podcasts. I've done a few podcasts. So I was excited to also have someone aligned with what you're describing as values. When I read about them, it felt so connecting and peaceful, I guess, to use the word of just recognizing that there's this place um, where it's, it's not only about being so much more than food. Like I don't, I wouldn't even put it that way. It has everything to do with food, but that that's not the end of the story or is it just the beginning of the story or where does it relate in your story in terms of what you really are hungry for? You know, what you really need to work on. Like, what is this really about for you? I find, and I don't know if you've experienced this in practice, sometimes people either quote unquote, know they have to change or they want to change. They just don't know how, but they might not be ready to hear how effective yeah. change truly is made from expertise, like, like yourself and dietitians. Like it's not just walking in and just saying, here's a list of foods to eat. Just tell me how to do this. And yeah. do you find that struggle with clients of understanding where they want to go, but helping them see how they need to get there. 
I, I personally don't feel that struggle. And I think it's just been the way that I work with everybody. And it's, you know, when we initially have an intake and I'm talking to them, I'm letting them know, I am not going to tell you how much food to eat and what food to eat right off the bat. I'm more interested in, are you sleeping? Do you have inflammation? What does your poop look like? I'm more interested in adding things to your life than taking things away. And I come from just a completely different mindset. And I think it's because I never was super fascinated with food my whole life. I love food. I love to eat. I love the food that I love, but I was a sick kid. And so we, I personally know that every single person is walking around with these emotional triggers Mm -hmm. and we all develop at least three to five in the first six years of our life. And then anytime we go through something traumatizing. And so I was a sick kid. I was in the hospital from the time I was 12 to 13 and went to UCLA for the next four years, every Wednesday for checkups. Mm. And I came from a place of, I just want to be and feel healthy. And so some doctor that I was working with at some point said to me, you know, food can make people sick or healthy. And that was my light bulb. And I was like, okay, I can help people be healthy. And then I started a practice after I went to graduate school and passed my exam and recognized, oh, people say they want to be healthy, but they really just think it's losing weight. They don't actually think long-term and sustainable. And I don't want to be around just to help somebody lose weight to gain it back. I want real long-term changes. So, you know, for me, I think that I, this, this book came out of me, my practice pours out of me because I come from a place of like wanting to grab everybody by their shoulders and saying, you can be healthy. Right. Right. You can lose weight and be healthy too. Like mind blown. Yeah. Like how, yeah. why is that something that isn't automatically assumed to be a mutual goal is, yeah. is crazy with the times. And they think that's what's so grounding about you and your book and your 27 years in practice, which I am like, you know, fangirling over. Um, I'm, I'm half the amount of you. Um, well, I'm fangirling over that. You're so lucky. <laughs> You're like way ahead of me. Look oh, how long no. it took me to get Just here. <laughs> change of the times, I think. But, um, but yes, because it's, it's also the sweet science, I want to say in the sustainability that you mentioned, the fact that you've been saying this since age 12. Yeah. And it's the message that doesn't go away because this is the real stuff. It's not it's so interesting to me. And we can talk about this, like fad diets and the craze. And I don't even care to pick on one. I'm never about that because it's yeah. irrelevant. It's irrelevant. Yeah. It plays on the uh, anxiousness, emotional adrenaline rush fix, because it's a very emotionally driven place. Like you mentioned a lot of yeah. trauma associated with it, or just other emotions. And it plays on that. And that's short lived in any context of that reaction and in food too. And you have to look at the messaging that's been consistent all these years. And it might not be yeah. sexy and it might be a little boring, but it's not sexy. Real. It's real. You know what? You know, what? talk about years and age. It's coming clear to me. I'm now like, I didn't hit 40 yet, 39, but I'm getting to the age where I feel like calmness and peace is sexy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We have, I mean, I was talking about my children who are 20, 17 and 14, and they're thinking about their Halloween costumes and, you know, there's just like all their friends, they're all not wearing as much clothes as like in my fifties, all I want to do is be comfy. I'm like, Oh my God, on Halloween, I want to wear one of those zip up, you know, onesies Yeah, (laughs) and be warm and comfy. We're just like totally opposite. So yeah, well, we get older. Yeah, it's, it's so funny. Yeah, because I also feel that comes from a place, and I think this is also relevant in the food world of becoming like your more authentic self, where you're just more comfortable with who you are, and you're just like, well, this is what I'm putting out there. I'm going in my big, comfy, yeah. you know, because this is what I'm feeling right now, and because you're feeling it, it just works. It works out there. Yeah, but by the way, you're right, and I think that is like hitting the nail on the head. The closer a person can get to advocating and being more authentic to themselves, the rest of the things fall away, Mm -hmm. right? And they can start recognizing, wait, my body actually doesn't feel good. 
Mm -hmm. when I have celery juice. Right. And so even though my neighbor was successful at losing 40 pounds by drinking celery juice, it's not working for my body. Right. And then you can start questioning, like, what can I do to help myself? And it's, I think that's the pivotal moment when you are clued in and paying attention to yourself. Because so many people with the emotional trauma, their minds are not in this moment. Their minds are somewhere else. So they're not even paying attention to what their body feels like. Right. And what's worse, and like, I'm curious what you think about this, is when like my clients go to the doctor and they're like, I don't feel very good. And the doctor says, everything looks great. You're mm -hmm. great. See you next year. Mm -hmm. There's and a lot of confusion. Mm -hmm. And they said, I don't feel very good. Yeah. I'm not tired. Right. What don't you I'm see on my numbers yeah. about myself. Right. And it also goes the flip side when they sometimes take a look at somebody and make assumptions about their diet when they actually can be really trying to eat healthfully. It's so much more involved. I think it starts back with what you said about your assessment and having a conversation yeah. and going through pointed questions about lifestyle yeah. and not numbers, right? It's not yeah. always about the numbers. Numbers are relevant and important, but they are what they are and that's it. And they are yeah. what they aren't too. And right. there's so many factors that affect it. And there's so much more that we don't know and so much more that they speak to. And especially when it comes to weight and potentially that could be where a lot of this angst comes from the fact that you can't control everything about your numbers. And that is actually the beautiful part of the process that your body has an innate ability to balance itself. If it's getting out your period and has to build up towards it and you're retaining water because of it, but then you get your period, which if it's someone's decision, God willing helps them have babies. Like this is all a good thing. Like your body has natural processes to balance itself and you're just here to help. Like you're just here to be like, I'm here to right. support you however you need. I'm not here to control you. Yeah. I'm not in my control. Yeah. I often say we live inside our bodies hmm. and it's really important to honor what our body is saying. And it communicates through telling us we're tired, we're hungry, we have to pee, we have to poop, you know, we need to sit down and it's up to us to like have the best relationship with our body. Right. No one else is going to do it for us. No one. But that's also the beauty of it. Like I said, you have technically yeah. full Full, I hate the word control, but you have the full ability to, to decide what you want yeah. to do with yourself. It's only on you. Um, but we'll talk a little bit more about that. I wanted to first say what I texted you. I really liked how I phrased what I wanted our topic to be called. And I just want to shout it out because I referenced it's the non-obvious reasons you're missing in successful weight management. Non-obvious speaks to me because I always tell people, you don't need to come to me to learn how to eat a salad. Like, you know, to eat a salad, like, okay, it's great to eat salads. It's great to have vegetables. Yay, kale. But that's not why you need me. And it's so interesting that I actually phrase it to you as non-obvious because actually it's the most practical and obvious things that oh, are you with the oxymoron. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And playing, I totally understood what you said, playing on that, uh, feeling of, Oh, a rule. Okay. My ears are perked up except no, not a rule. Um, so I'd love to go into those like non-obvious steps, guidelines, rules, whatever we want to call them. I want you to start with the last one. Cause that attracted me the most because are you serious? Talking. Yes. And I love that you're not talking anymore. Yeah. Because I want you to, to say what it, what it was. Um, well, the, are you talking about the six rules? Yeah. And the yeah, last one. Okay. So rule number six is to get seven hours of sleep yeah, every I, single I, night. I just hope my clients heard you say that because I feel I, if I ever had to do my PhD, which is not happening, but if I did with all the other time <laughs> I have in my life, I would love to study sleep. And I think it's such an underestimated Mm. tool in so much of our health, because I also work with clients who have overnight jobs and just their lifestyle just doesn't dictate yeah. adequate sleep at night. And their health is just really tough. A lot of them. And yeah. I just, and it's one of those things where they say eat vegetables or fruits every day and people just don't. Right. So it's one of those underestimated, non-obvious, obvious tools and I'd love to hear why you made that also one of your rules yeah. and how you found that to be a common link in your experience and what people can do for that. 
Yeah. So like you, I have always talked about sleep with my clients, but when the pandemic hit, I noticed that nobody was sleeping. And um, then I was really working on helping people deal with tools to help their nervous system. But when that happened, I went into like overdrive with, we have to fix this right away because you don't understand. You will not be able to lose weight. And if you aren't able to lose weight, you're not going to resolve your metabolic syndrome, which means your blood sugar, your blood pressure, your triglycerides, your cholesterol are all going to get elevated. So we really need to focus on sleep. And so our body detects stress and stress can come from a phone call. It can come from doom scrolling. It can come from being hungry. It can come from being full. It can come from so many different things. Lack of sleep. Our body detects stress in less than 10 seconds. It triggers the hippocampus, pituitary gland, and adrenal. And the adrenal complex, or the adrenal gland is responsible for our cortisol levels, mm -hmm. our cortisol level, and our sex hormones, and our blood sugar. But we'll focus on the cortisol. The cortisol is a hormone that we have in our body that is referred to as the stress hormone. Now in this regard, it's not a negative. The stress hormone is really important because it's the hormone that tells us when to wake up. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of like our alarm that goes off. We need it. And then the flip side is the melatonin, which is the one that lets us become drowsy at around nightfall and dark when it's a little dark and, you know, all the things. So melatonin, both of these hormones are naturally made. And the problem is during the pandemic, people started taking melatonin or sleep aids. And when you do that, it actually tells your brain to stop making it. Mm. So you're actually creating further problems. So for me, it really it was always a topic, but during like March of 2020, I like jumped on it and be, it became rule number six to make sure that we could fall asleep, stay asleep and wake up rested. Yes. I, I love all of that. And I also learned a lot through the pandemic and I feel like it feeds into your next rule or one of the rules, which is I live in the city life, right? In the Brooklyn, New York and it's an active lifestyle without even trying because yeah, lucky you can't you. find close parking and there's, you have to take the subway and you see people, seniors going up those steps and holding all their shopping bags because there's no carts and we all yeah. have to hold them. And then suddenly all that movement stopped. So yeah. another rule and something I noticed with the pandemic for, for a New York side of this was yeah. how much movement matters in any yeah. form. And how much we weren't getting it. I've never, I for, remember around June, end of June, I looked at my other dietitians and I'm saying, I think we have to start adjusting people's food because mm -mm. it was that they were not moving at all. And I never like touching people's foods. I never like giving guidance on, on amounts, but they weren't moving and yeah. it was a problem. So how does movement work within your guidelines and what kind of baseline recommendations can we give? Yeah, it's interesting. So um, the recommendation is really 7,000 to decrease your risk of sudden death by 50%. It also decreases your risk of almost every disease, but for weight maintenance. And so remember, we're, my goal is to help my clients get to their normal weight and then maintain it forever. And so that is a minimum of 10,000 steps every single day. And so in the old days, we used to do that in New York, in Brooklyn, New Jersey, we're doing, not necessarily New Jersey, but we're doing that. You guys are doing it. Um, that's increasing what you're talking about with strength and endurance, all the things. But when you move your body, it's actually helping your blood sugars, which mm -hmm. is the link to longevity and lowering your risk of all diseases. And it's also helped maintaining and balancing your hormones. So this is your, you know, female male hormones, and this is also your sleep hormones. It's also helping with digestion. In other words, it's working on your circadian rhythms. It's actually helping your master clock, mm -hmm. which is basically establishing your basal metabolic rate, how active your body is. It helps with sleep and wake. It's yeah. essential for everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, nobody, what, there was a line in like Legally Blonde at the end where she says something about um, endorphins make you happy. <laughs> there you go. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> Exercise releases endorphins. Endorphins make you happy. 
Exactly. And so we need it for all the things our, you know, like I just listed. So it became, I mean, that's always been a thing. And then 10,000 steps was always, yeah, rule number four. And, and there's so much to say about walking or movement in general. And people are, are, I feel sometimes a little intimidated to go to me because I'm very into fitness. And I said, no, you don't have to be me. This isn't about being some sports uh, crazed person. It's just about having movement, a regular part of your day. I think also maybe what your rules are pointing towards is, is lifestyle based, meaning these are part of your everyday work, you know, everyday, yeah. uh, routine and that all affects we. And that goes back to my first question because people feel overwhelmed in their weight because it's something they also see. So they feel just overwhelmed. It's a lot, it's visible and they just feel like they need to do such extremes to change it. They feel they have such a long way to go, but it's also because they're focusing on one solution, just the food. But if they focus yeah. on a couple of things, yeah, it seems overwhelming to learn about to start because it's new for you, but then yeah. it just all leads into each other. Wellness is a, is a circle of one thing feeding the next and what unfolds is more than what they thought. So it's only things that unfold into bigger, better things and help the other one too. And I like yeah. to teach people all at once because then I feel they don't have to over-focus on one if they can't. Like if they had yeah. a new baby and now they can't sleep. Okay, look, we, we still will work on that, right? Yeah. And, and have it as a priority as things unfold. But there's other things you can work on too. And you don't have to feel yeah. hopeless and fall down that spiral. Yeah. So like with somebody like that, I would work on changing the mindset from perfectionist to being more progressive because it's a very long journey and we don't have to rush to get them all in, but we do need to be working every single day to be intentional that they're happening. This is how we're going to change mm -hmm. our mind literally likes to sleepwalk through everything we're doing. So it spends almost all day doing 47% what we did yesterday. Mm -hmm. The reason why change is hard is because we have to be awake and our mind wants to be sleepwalking through the experience. And so we're making change, um, choices all day long. We have to eat five times a day. We're making choices on what to eat. So we should be available to be awake during that choice. Beth said, I need more fruits and vegetables, you know, for the lining of my gut to, you know, make me healthier in the long term. How can I add that in the way that I like to eat it? Not necessarily in the way that my neighbor wants to have it, right? Mm -hmm. We're making choices. Yes. And I'm going to harp on the word choices because again, I'm, I guess, I guess our roles today is me playing devil's advocate for clients that come to me. And now I'm yeah. excited to turn the tables of you on you and be like, I'm gonna be that person that walks in and says, I don't want to have to think about it. I don't yeah. want to have to make a choice to which I say to them, you make a choice with everything in life, with deciding yeah. what to wear in the morning. And again, I just reiterate how making this choice is going to only benefit you to um, only more benefits from the choice. And I actually like that choice. I like thinking about food during the day. It excites me. I think that stems from a place where, and this is what I wanted to get at with something earlier that you said, it, I think not wanting to think about it or not wanting to think about food or other elements you said earlier in the conversation comes from a place where maybe food was bad or thinking about food was bad or they're afraid to think about food because then they might get hungry and they're afraid to feel hungry because then they're yeah, of afraid course. they'll overeat. And then they'll, yeah. and, and then oh, I'm hearing all this like anxious system. People are like, no, it's nothing to do with emotions. I'm like, okay. Okay. All right. All right. Unraveled <laughs> into this whole thing when all I just said is what do you want for lunch? Yeah. Like, I mean, know? everybody makes choices from either a place of trust or fear, mm. no matter what, everything comes down to that. And so I have my first rule is to eat when you're hungry. And, you know, we haven't even talked about hunger and most mm. people don't experience hunger. And if you have gained a lot of weight or have a high body fat, you're not as hungry as you think. And what you are operating from is a place of fear. And how could you not be? And really to simplify it even more, I mean, we all have these physical bodies that are self-operating and self-healing. None of us said to your heart today, beat this many times, lungs do this, mind do this. I mean, sometimes right now you and I are having a conversation, so our mind is active. 
But our mind's job is also to keep us safe in the most pleasurable way. It's producing 60,000 thoughts a day in response to something we see, smell, feel, hear, and touch. And it's remembering our entire history. So if I'm feeling any discomfort in my body, and the last time I felt this way, I ate a cake, my mind is going to say, Kim, remember you ate a cake the last time you felt this way and you felt better. Hmm. But we have to remember that our mind is a liar. We have to remember that it's giving us a shiny object over here, taking us away from the physical discomfort of our body. And we have to know we can do really hard things. We're survivors. We've survived every day of our life so far. And so we have to know where our mind is and learn how to tame the beast. We have to stay in this moment so we can recognize, are we hungry or not? Are we eating this because someone put it in front of me or someone was talking about it? Can mm -hmm. I save this for later? Again, trust or fear. If we have come from a place of restriction, then we have no idea that we're going to be able to eat it later. But the truth mm -hmm. is we eat 21 times every single week. We can't remember anything we ate last week or the week before or last year at all. And so we're putting too much energy into thinking about food. We shouldn't be worrying about what we're having to for dinner next Thursday. I'm in this moment right now. And in this moment, I'm not hungry, even though there's cake, but I'm going to save that cake so I can have it when I'm hungry in an hour or two, because I know historically I get hungry a few times a day. Mm -hmm. you, I'm still on the trust, fear, distinguished <laughs> comment that's like mind blowing to me and such a straightforward way to think about it. You make a choice or a decision out of trust or fear. So that's why people who may feel overwhelmed in wanting, having to decide what to eat and going down this whole non-functional path of why that's giving them anxiety, ask themselves what place that anxiety is even coming from. Like what, yeah. what, what it brings up for them. Are they Afraid, or do they trust that they that in the decision that they're going to make? And I, I think that put it into perspective really well. And I even when I work with kids, have kid level discussions like that because kids really don't see the future and if they'll get this food again. And and if parents who are bringing the kids sometimes feel anxious about kids, poor kids just eating or wanting to eat. Yeah. And there's a whole element here. Um. So the trust of of the food coming next is like a, it's a very real fear. Um, of course we're humans we gotta really stay alive know. yeah um but then as you're older you're able like you said to uh be logical and and explain maybe to do the work you have to be awake for that you have yeah, to, to be awake kinda, you have to know where your mind is where did it just go why right. did it go there and then you know it's actually a training that's what the practice is that's how we progress that's why we don't need to be perfect Mm -hmm. We need to train our bodies and train our minds. And it starts with one single meal. And I have to experiment with this meal. Can I eat when I'm hungry? Can I trust that I don't need all of it, but it's right there if I need more. And once we survive that one meal, now we're rolling because now mm -hmm. we can do it a second meal. And now we can learn from that history, mm -hmm. but we, ha we have to practice and I right. can't do the practice for you. Right. I don't know if you have this sometimes that I kind of cut off clients sometimes if they're going too far in the sense where what you just said, where you have to say, you have to say, you need to first do it before we continue this conversation because yeah. first doing it. And then like you said, having the feeling and then being able to draw off of an experience is a major stepping stone to the next level. And a lot of times those questions go away or those fears get less, or you get more focused in, in your next move, but yeah, do what you do to discuss and everything, but then you got to go and just do it. So if we could just finish with some goals to maybe give people, um, and how to start implementing these steps so they can get to that next step. Like how do we set them up in a way with a goal to help alleviate a lot of these fears to get further in their weight loss or management journey? I would say that it's really important to recognize that living more soulfully and less ego-based means that you're understanding I could be anything and do anything I want in this moment, that I don't have to be the same. And so that has to be something you remind yourself of often is that in this moment, I can make any choice I need to make and not be living from the past. So the most important tool that I can offer anyone is to know where their mind is at any given time. So just for fun, do this with me, Beth. Repeat mm -hmm. after me, okay? Okay. Where is my body? Where is my body? 
It's right here. It's right here. Where is my mind? Where is my mind? Okay. So now you go find your mind. Where is it? So I wanted to touch my head. Right. You can touch your head, but also go and actually find where your actual mind is. Mm -hmm. And I like how you're looking for it. And did you find it? I felt like a, like a whole empty space. Okay. Do you know if your mind is thinking of the future or here or in the past? I'm pretty present. I think you are. Okay. But let's say you weren't. Okay. Then we would repeat it. And what would happen is you would actually be able to see your mind detaching Mm. from whatever it was already thinking about. And the truth is sometimes we can do it instantly. Sometimes it takes three tries, sometimes 10, depending on how anxious or wherever you are. And what happens is then your mind comes into this moment. And only in this moment are you actually able to tell me if you're hungry or not. Mm. We should only be eating for hunger. Sometimes there's birthday cake, right? Sometimes there's Halloween candy, but that's not every day of the year. And that's not two days in a row or three days in a row. And that birthday cake can be saved and eaten for your next meal or whenever, right? So the truth is, is that without an excuse, if you find your mind and then you're able to be inside of your body, then you can actually say, I'm hungry. And then it's actually being able to determine what hunger is. Now, how would you describe hunger? Hmm. How would I describe hunger? Hunger for me comes from a a deep place inside my body. Yeah. Where? Um, Which part? You can't see me, but I'm pointing towards like where I think my, you know, where your stomach is, where they show you to do a fist and put it right under your like right in between your rib cage, I guess you could say. I, f- I feel when I'm sincerely hungry, um, it's like I feel it inside. What do you feel? Like an ache, like a, mm-hmm. an empty tightness. Is it painful? Yeah, I was about to say a little bit uncomfortable. A little bit uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Is it, um, I would say that it's not painful. But I would say it gets worse as we get hungrier. Mm. Like it's a signal, right? We want to be in a relationship with our body. It's telling us we're hungry. We've ignored it. So it gets stronger on purpose. Yes. Kind of like a full bladder. Right. Kind of think we have to pee, but then we really have to pee and it's all we can think about. And then once we pee, we totally forgot that we were in any discomfort, right? Right. Isn't that amazing? And if I told you like, you're only going to pee once today, make it good. Like the, the fear of holding it and the bladder infections that would come up. I was about up, to right? say like, that it also causes more damage to feel like you got to right. get it all out. Same you know, with hunger. Like, eating, like you got to get it all in. We need to spread it out because we are existing on our blood sugar and our blood sugar needs to be refueled every three to five hours. Yes. And if you honor the hunger in the right moments, we're saying that you don't have to feel the fear because yeah. dictate that. Because it's wow. not actually scary or painful. It's just a a signal from your body saying, don't forget it's time to fuel. Wow. I love how you just put that. I give pool analogies, jumping into a freezing cold pool. I give like, wait, I want to hear that. I don't know it. Yours is just very straightforward. No, just about trying a new food. It's like jumping into a freezing cold pool. Then you're going to get used to it. Why would you do that? That sounds terrible. Especially when I know. (laughs) So good for you though. And your your whole line was so calming and made me feel so good. So I got to read your book more. And highlight some of these analogies better. <laughs> yeah. Um, we'll I want to thank you so much for the combo today. Please tell everyone how to get your book and how to follow you on social. Great. Thank you for having me. Um, my book is available everywhere. It's called, this is what you're really hungry for. And you can find it on my website, but you can find it everywhere. But um, my website is Kim Shapira method. I am Kim Shapira method everywhere on Instagram, Pinterest, what else? TikTok, all the things. That's And I love following you on social. It's it's the same genteel that you came here. It comes across just so you know, in your social, which is so beautiful to see. And that's why I'm so happy to meet you also now. Uh, It gives everyone just sort of daily reminders and a nice gentle touch of like change your life today. I love it. Yeah. Thank you. I feel the same about you. I'm so happy we did this. Uh, Yes. Thanks. Thanks for coming on. Don't forget to tune in for more episodes on Spotify. And be sure to follow us on TikTok at Instagram at Nourished by Beth for more wellness ideas.